Hello and welcome to this series of videos analyzing the August 2019 strategic case study pre-scene. This particular pre-scene is based on the fictional business of Zoom and over the course of the next 10 or so videos we'll be working through each page of the pre-scene document in detail, highlighting the most important issues relating them to your objective studies at the strategic level and talking about likely exam issues. So on the first page of this pre-scene document, you're told that you are a senior finance manager at Zoom, a transport network company, otherwise referred to as a TNC, and Zoom is in the business of taxi cab hire, but with a twist. It uses a mobile application or an app uh, with a website to match customers and drivers. So it's acting as an intermediary between drivers on the one hand and passengers on the other. The company also offers a bike sharing service, which is talked about in more detail later on in the pre-scene. Zoom operates throughout the fictional country of Jayland. We're not really given many clues as to where Jayland is based, but we know that it's a large and prosperous country where a big percentage of the population, around 85%, live and work in urban locations. So that means that the residents of Jayland are likely to have significant disposable income, which is obviously good from a demand point of view for Zoom. On the other side, though, it may also raise their wage costs. They would be expected to pay their software engineers, for example, uh, high wages. You report directly to the CFO of the company, uh, as a senior finance manager and you advise, advise on special projects and strategic issues. And in the final part of this introductory section, we're told that Jalen's currency is the J dollar. So let's work through the implications of this opening section. First of all, as a senior finance manager, you've obviously risen through the ranks. Uh, if you have been um, studying SEMA for a few years, you'll have done the operational case study where you would have been a lowly finance officer, just offering advice to managers, etc. Then in the management uh, case study, you would have been interacting more with senior leaders and trying to influence them a little bit more and considering the wider context of your business. And in a senior finance manager role, you're now interacting with the most important people at in the company and you will be expected to advise on strategic issues. So the senior manager role um, assumes uh, that you take a long-term focus. So you're very much uh, engaged in advising on strategic matters that play out over the next three to five years. You'll be expected to exhibit uh, significant influence um, in the form of people and leadership skills. As I said, you'll be interacting with the top people in the business and you'll be expected to, um, to influence them and to make suggestions that they would then take on board. Your audience, as I said, will be the top people at the, at the company. So you'll be interacting, obviously, with the CFO, maybe even the CEO and chairperson of the board. You'll be expected at the strategic level as well to understand the full context within which your business operates. So it's no longer just about considering what's best for your company, but also considering the wider uh, stakeholder groups that the company will interact with, such as regulators in the form of government forces, um, the customers of the business, obviously shareholders, uh, and the wider community within which the business works. You will be uh, expected to draw on objective test theories from E3, P3 and F3 to support any recommendations that you make. The big areas that are covered in the strategic case study tend to come from uh, the recommendation of strategic options, which you would have seen in your E3 studies, considering risks and how you mitigate risks, which you would have studied in P3, 
and F3 then would relate to uh, securing adequate forms of long-term financing and laying out the correct financial strategy for the business over the long term. So Zoom is, we're told later on, a private company. It's not listed on a stock exchange yet, although I wouldn't be surprised to see something come up on exam day in relation to that, given the fact that the most famous company uh, in this space, operating as a transport network company that everyone knows, is Uber. And Uber listed on the stock exchange this year in May 2000. And 19. So this is a topical issue and I wouldn't be surprised to see it come up on the day of the exam. But currently Zoom is a private company and there are pros and cons that come with being a private company as opposed to a publicly listed company. As a private company, obviously Zoom is missing out on the full range of funding options that a publicly listed entity would have. Um, Obviously, there are reputational benefits that come with the stock exchange listing. There's the perception that a stock exchange listed company has its house in order because it's expected to adhere to regulations, stock exchange regulations, to publish quarterly financial statements, to have their statements audited, etc. Um, But on the other hand, some of the pros that come with being a private company rather um, would relate to Uh, Not having to adhere, obviously, to those onerous regulations, which is going to save the company time and expense. And there isn't the same external pressure from shareholders chasing um, profitability over the short term um, at the cost of everything else and really pushing for a short term um, perspective. The fact that Jayland, as a fictional country, is operating with this um, fictional currency as well, the Jay dollar, leads us to ask at this early stage whether the company might be um, exposed to exchange rate risk, which you would have covered in F3. If they are exposed to exchange rate risk because they're trading over national borders and they're interacting with suppliers and customers in different countries, then they might want to look at hedging that risk somehow. But we'll talk about that as we move on. So Uber, uh, which is the most famous example of a transport network company, it's a company we will refer to uh, repeatedly throughout the pre-scene analysis and certainly We will uh, talk about Uber in detail in the industry analysis especially. It's a company that generates a lot of controversy. It's proved to be very popular, but on the other hand, it has um, attracted a lot of regulatory attention, a lot of pushback from entrenched uh, taxi unions, etc., that feel that Uber is... Um, is getting uh, an easy time in terms of adhering to regulations. They're not having to adhere to the same regulations as taxi companies. Uber also doesn't own its cars or employ its drivers, and that is exactly the same as for Zoom. And we'll talk through the implications of those two facts later in the pre-scene. So, as I said, Uber, highly controversial company. Zoom follows the same model and will be exposed to the same kinds of risks as Uber. Let's take a look at the background of the taxi cab hire industry. A taxi cab, we're told, is a form of public transport service in which the driver um, conveys passengers between a pickup point and a drop-off location. The, um, this form of transport is different to other public transport means such as public buses and trains where the locations are set by the service provider. Um, These forms of transport, public buses, public trains, tend to be subsidised heavily by the government uh, and as a result are cheaper for people to use. But on the other hand, they're very inflexible due to the set locations that are determined in terms of pick up points and drop off points. So this is the big advantage that taxi cabs have over um, these other forms of public transport. They offer more flexibility, but as a result, they're significantly more expensive. 
So we're told that taxi cabs are relied upon in modern cities now. And in the last decade, the face of this industry has changed because you've had disruptive technologies come on the scene and transport network companies such as Zoom, also referred to as ride hailing services, um, utilize these new technologies to match passengers with vehicle drivers. So this technology is housed in an application and these applications are accessed usually via mobile phones but they can also be accessed through websites on desktop computers etc and customers then can hail rides through these applications. It's important to point out that transport network companies cannot pick up street hails because customers can only request rides through the organization's app or website. Traditional cap taxi cab companies um, often pick up customers uh, that try to flag them down on the streets. So that's called street, uh, they're the street hails just referred to, but the TNCs cannot do that. So with disruptive technologies, um, the idea is that a service provider or product comes on the scene, it takes advantage of disruptive technologies to create usually an entirely new pr- product or service category. And subsequently, because it's so new, it tends to attract very high risks. People haven't seen something like this before. Um, it takes a while to get used to. There are regulatory hurdles to overcome, etc. And that introduces obviously a lot of risk and usually a lot of expense in the form of sunk costs, etc. But if it comes off, it tends to also come with very high potential rewards. And this is why Zoom has utilised its own disruptive technology to enter the taxi cab space in its home market. So through the use of an application, Zoom and companies like it act as a kind of intermediary and what we have is a two-sided market. So you've got Zoom or uh, another TNC in the middle with its application and on one side you have passengers and potential passengers and on the other side you have the drivers. And the idea that Zoom has uh, and Uber had in real life is to try to enlarge its network all the time to make it more valuable to the participants, to the passengers and the drivers. They try to enlarge the network by subsidizing one side and charging the other side. So how do they subsidize one side? Well, they try to incentivize drivers signing up by offering them bonuses and incentives. They try to make it as easy as possible and free to register on their application as a driver. And by attracting many drivers, that makes it valuable to potential travellers to also sign up to the application because they know that at any one time when they log in, there are going to be many Zoom drivers in their area to book with. So one of the issues with disruptive technology is that it's difficult to plan for a disruptive future because you often have entirely new products and services being offered that were previously difficult to imagine and the future becomes quite uncertain. A lot of industries are being disrupted by technology companies in particular. In the area of transport we're seeing a lot of innovation as it relates to autonomous vehicles that will eventually be driverless vehicles and there will be discussion of that soon. That's disrupting traditional car makers, for example. It will have tremendous consequences for taxi cab con- uh, companies as well. But if you think about companies like Airbnb and the way that they have disrupted traditional providers of accommodation in the forms of hotel chains, etc., and the way that they utilize their own um, their own application. And again, it's another example of a two-sided model where Airbnb is acting as an intermediary, um, trying to connect um, potential um, residents with accommodation uh, through the use of their application. 
doing something very similar to what Zoom is doing. But um, with so much disruptive technology, things tend to move very, very quickly and um, things can play out in very uncertain ways. So let's clarify some of the terms being used before we moved on. We need to distinguish, first of all, between ride hailing and ride sharing. The term ride hailing covers a range of businesses and services, we're told, including the traditional taxi cab services and the emerging TNCs, where a customer hires a driver to take them exactly where they want to go. They can hail a, ta a taxi cab from the street in the form of traditional taxis or by making a phone call. Or with the new TNCs, they virtually hail a ride through the application or website. Now, one of the things with the traditional way of flagging down a taxi uh, on the street is this quite inefficient. You could be standing on a street for 20 minutes before a taxi actually appears and there needs to be this um, coincidence of passenger and driver meeting by chance. It's quite inefficient and it takes a lot of time. But the idea with the application is that inefficiency is gotten round and that things go a lot smoother through the use of an application. Ride sharing then is actually how a lot of these TNCs started out. But the idea is that um, ride sharing relates to sharing uh, a journey with another passenger or passengers. And it's based on the principles of improving social interaction and mobility. Uh, it's there to improve uh, environmental protection because there would be fewer cars on the road if more people are sharing rides, etc. And there'd be less in the way of emissions. There are going to be cost savings for those utilizing um, this ride sharing service. This the cost is being split amongst two, three, four passengers. And several of the, the new TNCs that have come on the scene started out as ride sharing businesses, but have evolved into ride hailing businesses. And in fact, most of the revenue uh, now being generated by TNCs comes from ride hailing services. But ride sharing is still part of what a lot of TNCs currently do. Uber still offers this uh, option. But the Uber CEO recently came out and said that it's a bit of a battle against societal norms. He said that people seem quite comfortable to share other forms of transport with one another, with strangers. Uh, when they get on the metro, for example, they're doing that. When you get on a, a public bus, you're doing the same. But people feel weird about getting into a private car with three or four other people in close proximity. They're sharing a journey with them. And in that way, it's a little bit of an uphill battle. And as a result of that, um, trying to book the trend and go against societal norms, uh, Uber has actually had to, had to heavily discount these rides. And in many cases, the shared rides are up to 75% cheaper than a private journey. Um, and that is all geared towards getting more people to take up this option. But uh, the idea is that if they were able to charge closer to the rates that they want to charge, that these rides could actually prove to be even more profitable than their ride hailing services. Because you would be charging less per passenger, but the total fare would come out uh, in excess of what one passenger would pay, pay for a ride hailing service. So Zoom uh, should be potentially looking at its ride sharing, at ride sharing, as a way to improve profit margins potentially if they can get over this uh, idea that it's against societal norms and try to incentivize more people to take up this option, um, tying it to especially the need to reduce uh, emissions and to uh, do more for the environment. It's something that um, these companies certainly could get behind. And it's one of the few areas as well where they can kind of take the moral high ground. They often come in for a lot of criticism in terms of their employment practices, etc. But this is certainly an area where they can demonstrate that they're good corporate citizens. So let's take a look at the background and history of Zoom. Zoom was founded in 2014 by Seema and Dev Khan, a married couple, uh, who had the idea to start a convenient ride-sharing business in their home country. So it's important to point out 
that Zoom is not a first mover uh, in the global scene because Uber was actually um, the first to the market in 2009. So Uber preceded Zoom by a full five years. Nevertheless, Zoom has done very well in its home market. Um, It started up because Seema and Dev were having difficulty finding convenient and inexpensive transport. So that is at the heart of what Zoom and other TNCs want to do. They want to provide convenience and they want to provide a cheaper option. The fact that they were having difficulty finding convenient transport, uh, cheap transport, means that there was obviously a scarcity of this kind of transport. So presumably the, um, the big alternative was taxi cabs. So because taxicab licenses are controlled, they're very, it's a very regulated market usually, uh, but it varies depending uh, on the country, but usually it's a, a very regulated market. Licenses are quite expensive and that way there aren't too many of them. And that creates scarcity. And what happens when there is a scarcity of services or products? Well, the price tends to go up. And what Zoom and other companies have tried to do is to counter that scarcity by providing lots and lots of drivers uh, available and that drives prices down and obviously makes it convenient for people to find transport when they need it. So Seema and Dev, they started Zoom up out of their own frustration with what was an offer in their home country. They designed a website uh, and prototype and tested several mobile apps in 2013. And they started by operating a few cars around Capital City to test the service, starting out as a ride-sharing facility. So you would have three or four or five passengers um, sharing a car at any one time. And with this mobile application, they were acting as the intermediary. They were establishing a platform and they found out that demand was high. And as a result of that, they knew they were onto something good and the company grew rapidly. Over the next four years, up until about 2018, which takes us to um, the current point almost, um, venture capitalists poured in and invested a total of 1.2 billion J dollars to date. So that means venture capitalists have put 300 million dollars into the company every year over the last four years. And that is how Zoom has secured the financing to grow their business. They're not relying on debt financing. They're not relying on the share, the sale of shares on a public market. Instead, they have these private venture capitalist investors. Now, that doesn't mean that these people are not um, looking for a return. They are looking for a very, very attractive return. They were attracted by the growth that they saw and the idea that they will have a big payday in the future. So these venture capitalists who've sunk all this money in, they're expecting a payoff uh, some day. They are very high interest stakeholders and they have very high power. They can turn off the tap at any time if they're not happy. So they're a key player in accordance with Mendelo's matrix. So what we're seeing here is the very same thing that has happened with Uber in real life, that their growth their expansion. They've expanded very rapidly and very aggressively in a number of markets. Zoom is a little bit different because it's just expanded rapidly in its own market. It's not gone into other markets yet. But with um, Uber, um, the growth that they have um, seen has come from private venture capitalists. And a lot of people have kind of drawn comparisons between the amount of money going into the TNCs like Uber, and what happened in the late 1990s with the tech bubble. You had a number of companies then that were generating uh, often not much in the way of revenues, but they had these wild valuations and investors were pouring money into some firms that had yet to show they were viable businesses. And a lot of the businesses were actually making losses. And indeed, Uber is making huge losses year to year. And indeed, Zoom is doing the same. When we look at their profit and loss statement later, we'll see that they're making losses in the last two years. So this is very much a medium term to long term 
um, bet on the part of these venture capitalists. And there are plenty of investors out there who believe that these people are not going to get the return that they so desperately seek. When we look at the financial statements later on, the statement of financial position, we'll see that this company is actually pretty asset light. And that's typical for a technology business. Most of their value comes in the form of intangible assets. The total um, physical assets of the business come to $606 million J in 2018, which is well below the $1.2 billion put into the company by investors to date. But it's quite likely that a lot of the value would reside in the value of the brand, um, in intellectual property, etc., so venture capital seeks very high growth and very high returns. And again, I am drawn to the example of Uber because Uber listed in May 2019. And the idea was that there with the initial public offering that Uber investors, the early investors would get their payday. And they were talking about a valuation of $100 billion. And on the very first day, um, there was a big disappointment because the valuation came to about $70 billion. So there was a lot of talk about it being one of the most disappointing um, IPOs in recent times. And subsequently, the share performed quite poorly as well. So it really does remain to be seen whether Uber is a good proposition over the long term. Zoom, uh, we're told was operating in 200 towns and cities by the end of 2018 with 10 million registered users. So that's 10% of the total population of Jayland. That's impressive reach. And with more users, that's going to attract more drivers to its platform. When there are more drivers, it's going to attract more users. So you have a virtuous circle there. And we'll talk about those network effects in a little bit more detail there. But generally, what um, Zoom is trying to do is to enhance its network to increase the number of drivers and the availability of cars. And that will attract more people to its network as well. With a high supply of drivers as well, what it does is, does is push the price down and they can disrupt the market in that way. So the traditional um, taxi cabs find it hard to compete. Zoom has 1,400 employees, although that's controversial because they have a huge number of drivers operating, um, and we'll talk about that in a while. And their headquarters in Capital City uh, is where they carry out the following activities. Marketing and communications, which accounts for 40% of their employees. Technological infrastructure management and development, which is 10% of their employee base. Customer services, 20% of their employees. Business development and other is 20%. Research and development is 10%. And as I said, drivers are not employees of the company. Instead, they're classed as independent contractors. And this is one of the most controversial aspects of what the TNCs are doing. They're not um, paying a whole host of employee-related benefits as a result of this and taxes, etc. And this has drawn a lot of adverse publicity. So there are ethical questions here and corporate social responsibility questions here about their workers' conditions. So it's interesting, I think, that um, as a technology company, often what you see is that research and development accounts for a big chunk of what they're doing. But we see here that R&D activities only account for 10% of their employees' uh, activities. And we'll see later, is that one of the reasons that is the case is because uh, Zoom is not actually developing its own proprietary technology. It's actually using a lot of third-party applications, and that keeps R&D costs down. On the other hand, though, they don't own that proprietary technology, and it makes them vulnerable to competitors coming and just copying that technology. Marketing communications is high because this is a company that needs to be visible if the technology can be easily copied, the brand is important. It needs to be very present um, for um, potential passengers and drivers to increase those network effects that I've been talking about. So here we can see the kind of growth that Zoom has been enjoying in recent times. 
uh, based on the number of rides given by Zoom drivers in the millions. They started out in 2014 with 2.1 million uh, rides and they've seen rapid growth from uh, on each of the subsequent years. They tripled the number of rides they offered in the second year. Then they multiplied by six the number of rides that they gave in 2016. And they've been going on with impressive growth ever since, more than doubling in most of those in uh, subsequent years. And they've gotten to the point where in 2018, they had 180 million rides. Um, and in 2019, they're expecting very... Uh, significant growth of 142%. They're expected to reach 435 million rides. So what we see in the earlier stages is um, it's kind of like the introductory stage of the product life cycle where you have lower sales. There's going to be a high cost of serving each customer. The company would likely be making losses. That's certainly the case for Zoom even up to the current day. And there won't be many competitors. And that's all ringing true based on what we will see later uh, in this pre-scene. And the idea is that Zoom and Uber in real life can get into the growth stage of the product life cycle where they see increasing sales, that's certainly the case, falling costs per customer, which isn't really happening yet, profitability, not happening yet, and honestly, based on the losses that Uber is making in real life, and Zoom is making, it's going to be very difficult to turn that loss-making uh, around, uh, around in the short term. It's going to be a longer-term play, I believe. And in the growth stage as well, you're going to attract more competition. And that is certainly a danger for Zoom. Jayland, which we've talked about briefly, is a developed economy with over 100 million people. So that is quite a big country. And 85% of this population lives in urban towns and cities. And we know that 10 million of this 100 million population uh, are registered users with Zoom. So Zoom has made impressive inroads in its domestic market. We're told that public transport services and infrastructure are well developed, um, but they're coming under increasing pressure due to the influx of people into urban locations in recent years. As a result of that influx of people, you have overcrowding on public trains and buses, there is a lot of pollution and traffic congestion due to the high number of private cars and roads, and all of this plays into Zoom's hands. They're offering an alternative to all of this. And as I said, the area of pollution uh, Zoom can take the moral high ground here with its ride sharing service where they're trying to get three or four people to use a ride, share a ride at the same time and cut down on the number of private vehicles being used. Those people might be travelling in their own cars otherwise. And what we have with the overcrowding on public trains and buses, which, as I said before, tends to be heavily subsidised by the government, is something known as the tragedy of the commons. Um, where there's a public um, utility or good or service and because no one person is bearing the cost directly of having to provide that service or good, um, most people then tend to abuse it. They're not bearing the direct cost and because we tend to value what we pay directly for, um, people um, just um, use it, overuse it and you have overcrowding and things like that on public transport and public uh, public trains and buses. So the population of Jayland is highly educated. They're very responsive to technological developments. And moreover, the government in Jayland is very supportive of the technology industry and very keen to seek ways to solve um, the transport issues that they're facing. So throughout this pre-scene, we'll see that the government in Jayland is very forward-thinking and they are very open to companies like Zoom um, helping out with the transport crisis. And that is at odds, actually, with many governments worldwide, um, where companies like Uber have met significant resistance from regulators and government bodies in other countries. So this is a big plus in Zoom's favour. The government is on side. 
Um, and what the government is trying to do here is to outsource the fixes for transport problems to the private sector. So rather than come along and um, increase taxes to pay for more public transport, which would probably be very unpopular, um, they're just saying, look, we're going to let the private sector step in and try to alleviate some of this burden. Um, demand conditions then look very favourable as well because we've got a big population. This is a, a country with a big urban population. They're very much open to new technological developments and they are looking for alternatives to the current um, public transport and transport private transport options um, available.